Real people. Real crimes. Real life drama. The only reason I'm sitting here in front of you is because somebody's dead. I never intended for anything to happen. I never even intended to go out that night, let alone hurt somebody. Robert, anything to say is 11 family. Or kill somebody. Over here, over here, over here. Over here. Chambers, chambers, chambers. Did you think about Jennifer Levin? Every day. She's having her way with me, without my consent, with my hands behind my back, hurting me. I swung my arm, I struck her neck and throat area and I pulled her off of me and to the side. Down. Did she speak again after no. she fell to the ground? No. I'd never seen a dead person before. After you killed Jennifer Levin, you walked home, you got undressed, and you went to bed. You know how callous and unfeeling that sounds? Do you know how callous and unfeeling it feels? And that's Robert, how do you feel? You have a chance to say at least a word. Robert, can you just tell us how it feels to be out of jail and what you're thinking right now? I was responsible for her death. Okay. There is no question about that. You admitted guilt, but you did not intend to kill her. I don't believe I intended to kill her at all. It was an accident. Yes. But if it was an accident, why wouldn't you call? an ambulance why wouldn't you call the police because i was scared everything he said about how she died is absolutely untrue this is the left side of his face there's one deep severe scratch mark and there's another long mark here that tells us that she was face to face with the person who was trying to kill her that tells us that she was frantically fighting for her life you had your hands around her neck, and you squeezed. No, I did not. There was not a struggle for life. Am I a monster? No. Because if I were a monster, I wouldn't care. But I do. I'll never be termed a great person. I may never be termed a good person, but maybe one day, I'll be a person that learned. But that didn't happen. As Troy Roberts and I will show you, Robert Chambers was soon making headlines once again. I'm Richard Schlesinger. Tonight on 48 Hours, The Preppy Killer. Forty-eight hours. We'll be back in ninety seconds. In two thousand three, Robert Chambers walked out of prison after fifteen years, a free man, still pursued by his own infamy. He was 36, but people still remembered him from the summer of 1986 when he was 19. In New York, a city where killers get titles, Robert Chambers quickly became known as the preppy murderer. He looked the part and his face was everywhere. The story of how he strangled a beautiful 18-year-old named Jennifer Levin in Central Park 
was the talk of the town. There was a horrible, grisly murder of a beautiful young woman. Pete Hamill was a columnist for the New York Daily News. There's a rule of thumb in the tabloid business that a murder at a good address is better than your run-of-the-mill murder. It happened on Manhattan's Tony Upper East Side, a neighborhood known more for money than murder. Chambers and Levin had dated before and met the night of August 25th at Dorian's Red Hand, a bar that catered to the sons and daughters of the rich. Robert and Jennifer left Dorian's around 4 or 4.30 in the morning. At 6.20, a cyclist in the park found her body. Jennifer's body was found under this tree. Which Linda Fairstein tree prosecuted Robert Chambers, who became a suspect within hours of the murder. She was a 48 hours consultant. The police went to Robert Chambers because they knew he was a friend of Jennifer's. They went there so that he could help identify how she got separated from her friends. Oh, so when they first met Robert Chambers, he was not a suspect? Not in the least. The minute the two detectives, homicide detectives, saw him, they saw deep, fresh, bloody scratches on both sides of his face. His first explanation, that his cat scratched him, quickly collapsed. And after police brought him in for questioning, he admitted killing Jennifer. He said it was an accident. I didn't mean to hurt her. I liked her very much. The story he told police seemed to blame Jennifer. It was shocking and graphic. He's raping you in the park? She's having her way with me, without my consent, with my hands behind my back, hurting me. Simply put, Chambers' story was, in what came to be called rough sex, Jennifer hurt him, and he struck her to make her stop. But I reached up like this and grabbed, and I came down like that on my hand. She came over this way and landed right there, right next to the tree. Did you believe any of what you heard on that tape? Everything he said in that statement about how she died um, is absolutely untrue. When police undressed Chambers, they discovered more scratches on his chest. Fairstein says these injuries were not from rough sex, but from a violent struggle in the park. They argued about something. What it is, we'll never know. Bob, why'd you do it? Chambers was charged with second-degree murder. As the trial approached, Fairstein began learning a lot about the so-called preppy murderer. She believes the only thing preppy about him was his looks. His button-down costume covered up a life of crime and addiction. He looked like a male model. People treated him like he was a graduate of uh, an Ivy League college and had this prep school background. And yet, in fact, his days were really spent with the underbelly of New York drug life. Doing what? Stealing to get the money to buy drugs. This videotape gave the public a peek at the real Robert Chambers, Fairstein believes. It was made at a party Chambers attended while he was on bail. Chambers, holding a doll, appears to mock Jennifer Levin's death. I think I killed him. Jennifer's mother, Ellen, appearing on the Larry King Show, thought Chambers showed his true colors on that tape. I was horrified when I saw it, but in a way I was also glad that he showed himself for what he really was. During the trial, Chambers' lawyer mounted a defense some described as lurid and salacious that tried to damage Jennifer's character. I felt like I was burying my daughter every time I opened the newspaper and read the horrible headlines, you know, attacking her reputation. After almost three months of testimony and nine days of deliberating, the jury appeared unable to reach a verdict. So Fairstein made a deal. Chambers pled guilty to first-degree manslaughter. It was a step down for murder, but as part of the agreement, Chambers had to admit in open court that he intended to hurt Jennifer when he killed her. The Levin family have gone through hell because of my actions, and I am sorry. Despite all the evidence she had against Chambers, Linda Fairstein could never prove one crucial point, why Chambers would want to murder Jennifer. You couldn't stand up in front of the jury and say, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Robert Chambers killed Jennifer Levin because they argued about X, Y, and Z. You couldn't not. say that. I could not Did say that. Did that hurt you? Oh, yes, it hurt tremendously. I mean, 
I can tell you as a matter of law that the prosecution does not have to prove motive. Um, I can tell you as a matter of fact that there's nothing that the jury would like to hear more than why that happened. There's only one person alive who knows what happened that night. He never spoke at his trial, and he hasn't spoken since, until now. After his release from prison, we brought Robert Chambers to a hotel outside of Washington, D.C. Have you been able to take a walk by yourself yet? Uh, I've been out for walks. He'd reunite with his parents. No, there were a lot of people out walking around. And for the first time, talk publicly about his crime. Right now, if I had a choice between talking to you right now and being back in the box solitary, I'd choose solitary in a second. It's a lot easier than this. I don't want to be here. But Chambers felt by doing one major interview, the media attention might ease up. And he also had a personal agenda. Robert Chambers wanted to talk about Jennifer Levin. Did you think about Jennifer Levin? Every day. As the afternoon passed, the interview would go on for four right. tense hours. And every day I know that I'm in prison. I'm in prison because somebody died and I am responsible for that. It's not an easy feeling. You don't get comfortable with it. And it's part of my life for the rest of my life. Over and over again, Chambers apologized for the way he learned. lived his life I feel and the I way he had and stolen Jennifer Levin's. Because I can never make up for the death of Jennifer Levin. I can never make up for the pain I caused her family. I've been a bad person. Am I a monster? No. Because if I were a monster, I wouldn't care. But I do. But to millions of Americans who saw this tape of a teenage party, a belief had been built. Robert Chambers had no concern for the Levin family's endless pain. Oh, stop! Stop! I think I killed him. The videotape of you at that party was perhaps the single most defining moment in this whole story. There were people out there were willing to give you the benefit of the doubt until they saw you on that videotape. Mm -hmm. What were you thinking? Huh, if I was thinking, I would never have been there. I was stupid, I was arrogant. I mean, everybody was just acting silly. And I acted silly. Reenacting a crime? Certainly not. It was not? No, not reenacting a crime. It sure did look like that to me. I can see how it may be interpreted like that. You weren't trying to give someone the impression that this was Jennifer Levin, the doll? No. Rob, how could you be so dumb? <laughs> that seems to be a theme that runs through many things that I do. Rehearse lines from a con artist or genuine repentance. Chambers seemed to want the world that had condemned him to reconsider its judgment. And, and I think people at home may suspect that what you're doing right now is playing a role a role that you perfected pretty well as a teenager. Mm -hmm. What do you say to that? Would I like to be forgiven? I wouldn't even think of asking for that. Would I like the opportunity to apologize with actions behind it, backing it up? Yes. Am I acting? I don't know how to act. I'm too scared to act right now. You say I'm well-mannered and everything. I'm here holding my hands. I'm scared, but I'm here. Robert Chambers was a working class kid in a white glove neighborhood. You know, the museums, all the cultural things, the social situations, the, the fancy tuxedo balls that they have, the debutante balls. It was something that was part of the culture of the area. His father, Robert Sr., was a credit manager. 
his mother Phyllis, an Irish immigrant, was a private duty nurse. It was her determination, not any family fortune, that gained Robert Chambers access to an exclusive world of privilege, possibility, and private schools. You had to work tremendous hours to pay the bills. Yes, but I never minded doing it because my parents' education was a very big and important area in their lives. And you wanted to do the same thing for your son? Yes. She wanted the best, she always worked hard, gave me what, not only what I wanted, but what I needed, which might have been good education, although, you know, I screwed that up myself. Robert Chambers bounced from one prestigious prep school to another in a blur of bad behavior and poor grades. He eventually graduated and went on to college, but just for a semester before he was asked to leave there too. I'm running around, partying all the time. I didn't take life seriously. I didn't take school seriously. What were your hopes for him? That he would pursue a good education, be the best person he could be, and help others. You disappointed her terribly, Robert. Yes, I did. How do you even begin to make it up to her? How do you do that? I think probably by letting her know that I take responsibility for everything I did. But as a teenager, responsibility was the last thing on Robert Chambers' mind. You'd get high for three days and sleep for two days, get up and do it again, and somehow squeeze school in there, if you could manage it. Partying with people often twice his age. Women were very attracted to you, even at a very young age. What did that do to your ego? <laughs> Built it up so big you couldn't walk through a door. But along with the swelled ego came a far more serious problem. Cocaine. Cocaine. Mm -hmm. How often did you snort coke? Three times a week, four times a week, somewhere around there. Would you describe yourself as a drug addict? Yeah. Yeah, I have an addictive personality. So how much money were you spending on your habit? Probably two, three hundred dollars a week. How did you find $300 a week? Sometimes money from my family, sometimes money from work, and sometimes doing things that were wrong, taking things, selling things. The homes in the upscale neighborhood were Chambers targets. Police estimate he and a partner stole as much as $70,000 in jewelry and other valuables. So you started burglarizing homes? Yeah, I did. It was this Robert Chambers, a petty thief and drug addict, who walked through these doors on August 25th, 1986. Dorian's Red Hand is a comfortable hangout on Manhattan's Upper East Side. It was summer's end. Unlike Chambers, most of the young people at the bar were heading back to college. Young people full of hope, full of the future. Young people like Jennifer Dawn Levin. By all accounts, Jennifer was bright and ambitious, having succeeded in the same types of schools where Robert Chambers had failed so miserably. When did you first meet Jennifer Lover? I believe the first time that I was ever introduced to her was at a party. Describe Jennifer Levin. Tall, dark hair, pretty face, funny laugh, smart, compassionate. Some of her friends say Jennifer found Chambers intriguing, wanting more of a relationship than he was really interested in. So how many times did you, did you go out with Jennifer? before that night in August? Three times, I think. Three times? Yeah. And you were intimate with her? Yeah. She was your friend? Hmm. She was a friend to me. I was not a friend to her. I wasn't a friend to anybody at the time, not even to myself. Jennifer Levin and Robert Chambers had arrived separately at Dorian's that night, where they met by chance. I believe I looked over and I saw her sitting at the table with her friends. Did she approach you or did you approach her? No, at first it was just kind of like, you know, you know, wave, hey, how you doing? But something awkward and unexpected came up. Chambers was dating another girl at the time and she was at the bar too. When she saw him speaking with Jennifer Levin, she grew angry, confronted him and stormed out. The district attorney would later suggest that argument so upset Chambers that it was a motive for murder. You know, I wasn't angry. I guess the best way to say it, I was so shallow at the time that, all right, I, I lost a relationship. I'll try something new. Okay, you yelled at me. Sorry. I'll 
move on. Chambers says he did not use cocaine that night, that he had a few beers and two tequilas, and that around by 4 a.m. closing time, he and Jennifer Levin would leave Dorian's together, heading towards Central Park. And we started walking, and we were talking, and we ended up walking towards Fifth Avenue, and we were near the museum. Chambers says when he told Jennifer he wasn't really interested in a serious relationship, she scratched his face, but they then continued their walk into the park. And what happened next? We started fooling around. We never got undressed, undressed. And she reached down and she grabbed my testicles. And, you know, in a couple of seconds, you know, talking, fooling around the whole bit, she squeezed. And between the squeeze and possibly the nails, it hurt. And in pain, shock, even anger, I reacted. I sat up, I swung my arm, and I hit her. How hard? I would have to say hard. I made her fall to the side. I made her fall off of my body. Where did you hit her, Robert? In the throat area. In the throat area? Yeah. And when she fell, did she fall silent? I don't remember any sound. Did she speak again after no. she fell to the ground? No. At what point did you know she was dead? When I stood up and tried to gather myself together, and she wasn't moving, and I was saying, let's go, let's get out of here. It's time to go, let's go. She didn't move, and her eyes were open, and I knew Something was wrong. I didn't get down, I didn't listen for the heartbeat. I didn't get down, I didn't do CPR. I didn't do any of the things that a responsible person would have done. If this was an accident, Robert, why wouldn't you call somebody? Why wouldn't you call 911, call an ambulance, call the police if this was an accident? Mm -hmm. If it wasn't your fault? It was my fault. But if it was an accident, why wouldn't you call an ambulance? Why wouldn't you call the police? because I was scared. The shattered night still hung over New York Central Park. Jennifer Levin lay dead, and Robert Chambers inexplicably stayed there, staring at the young woman he told us, as he has always insisted, he killed by accident. I had never seen a dead person before. Her eyes are open, and she's not moving. And I was just scared. I didn't do anything. I just sat there. As dawn broke, Chambers remained at the crime scene, sitting quietly on a stone wall only a few feet away. A woman on a bicycle noticed the silhouette of Jennifer Levin's body. Soon, the police and an ambulance arrived. I watched as everybody arrived. It seemed the whole world arrived. The whole world came to see what I did. Police started clearing the crowd. And eventually he got to me and they said, you, go, move. The police told you to leave? Yeah, they told me to leave. After you killed Jennifer Levin, you walked home, you got undressed, and you went to bed, and you slept. I think I slept. I don't know if I slept. You know how callous and unfeeling that sounds? Do you know how callous and unfeeling it feels? No. No, you don't but I do for the rest of my life. Could Jennifer Levin's death have been an accident? Chat now on Twitter and Facebook. When detectives arrived at the crime scene in Central Park on the morning of August 26, 1986, they found Jennifer Levin's partially clothed body under a large elm tree. It looked like she had been in a fight for her life. Cuts and bruises marked her body, and around her neck were bright red hemorrhages indicating strangulation. The body was lying on the ground. Some of the clothing on her had been pushed to the upper portion of her body. The medical examiner estimated the time of death at approximately 6 a.m., about two hours after Jennifer Levin left Dorian's with Robert Chambers. I never intended for anything to happen. I never even intended to go out that night, let alone hurt somebody 
or kill somebody. When police showed up at Chambers' home later that morning, they were stunned at his appearance. He had deep scratches on his face and arms and injuries to both hands. Chambers first told police that the family cat had scratched him, but under questioning at the precinct later that day, he changed his story. Uh, while we were sitting there, I was explaining this to her, you know, saying I'm interested in other people and that you're going away and I don't want to be bothered. Uh, and she freaked out and she just, she like got up and knelt in front of me and she just scratched my face. And I have these marks, I didn't even notice until this morning. The injuries you sustained indicated a struggle. You had deep scratch marks on your face. What happened? She became upset about one thing. And the one thing was that I did not take her seriously. And with that, she scratched me. So you're telling me she scratched her face, and then you decided to still have sexual relations with her? It wasn't. That doesn't sound. It was not. Look, it, it was not. Ludicrous. You know that. It wasn't done because I hate you. I want to hurt you. You were mad after she scratched you? I wasn't happy, but I mean, was I in a rage? No, I wasn't in a rage. During the interrogation, Chambers would go on to tell detectives that Levin tied his arms behind his back with her panties. She molested me in the park. She hit me. How could she molest you? We're talking about what? Girls, girls cannot. Girls she cannot. Can't do it with Tony. Tony. Like... The media would call it rough sex, and it would become central to Chambers' defense. You're a big guy. Yeah. You could have defended yourself without hurting her seriously, right? I could have pushed. I could have yelled. I could have pulled her hair to the side. Why didn't you do any of those things? Because I wasn't thinking about what I should do in the situation. If you sought medical attention, they could have saved her. It's very possible. And this is something that will be in my mind forever. Would it have made a difference? I don't know. Would it have helped me? Sure. The police precinct is 50 yards away. Why didn't you go there? Why didn't I do so many things? I was scared. I froze. But when you hear all these experts say it just couldn't have happened the way you're describing it. Certain experts, the district attorney's experts. It's very clear from the medical examiner's evidence and from the pathologists mm -hmm. that you choked Jennifer Levin. It wasn't just a split second. You had your hands around her neck and you squeezed. No, I did not. Now, the cuts and bruises she didn't sustain from any talk, any discussion like that. The bruises that she sustained came when I struck her. You've done your time. And this is the moment to set the record straight. Mm -hmm. And this is your story. Yes. This is the story you'll die with. Yes. My story has not changed. There is nothing to change. It's not a story that's pleasant. It's not a story people like. It's not a story that fits into people's perceptions. You know why? Because it's not a story. It's the truth. But according to the evidence in this case, says Linda Fairstein, who prosecuted Chambers, nothing could be further from the truth. She didn't believe Chambers in 1986 when she first heard his version of how Jennifer died, and she doesn't believe him now. How would you characterize Chambers' claim that there was no struggle that night? I characterize it as ludicrous and completely incredible. Uh, Fairstein studied the pattern of wounds determined by the medical examiner to be strangulation marks on Jennifer's neck. They were lines, long, lines going in different directions. Every pathologist who looked at them told me clear indications of repeated applications of force. So many marks on the neck um, that it's completely inconsistent with one blow. Jennifer Levin had wounds and bruises all over her body, far too many, according to Fairstein, to believe Chambers' story that she died from a single blow to the neck. He would literally have her, and I don't mean to ridicule this, bouncing down a hill in the park to have, uh, to have received all of these injuries. It's just a, a, an absurd story. 
And Fairstein says those scratches on chambers are more evidence of a violent confrontation than the heated argument he describes. This is the left side of his face. There's one deep, severe scratch mark, and Jennifer had nails. Uh, there's another long mark here. There's smaller ones, a long one, a long one going in a different direction, again a different direction, behind that another one. What does that tell you she was doing? That tells us that she was face to face with the person who was trying to kill her. That tells us that she wanted him off her body. That tells us she wanted him to stop to let go of her, to let her breathe. Um, and she was frantically fighting for her life. And on Chambers' hands, photographed the day Jennifer was killed, Fairstein says you can see bite marks. She believes Jennifer bit Chambers when he put his hands over her mouth to stop her from screaming. Chambers argues he did nothing to help Jennifer after he noticed she wasn't moving, because in his words, I was scared, I froze. I don't buy it. He's never reported to his friends that he froze. Uh, Fairstein says I witnesses talked to Chambers story. while he was sitting on this stone wall, watching the police that morning as they worked the crime scene around Jennifer's dead body. And when they said, should we do something to help? He said, no, there's nothing to do. Uh, the police are handling it. And then he got up and walked away and went home and went to sleep. I don't call that freezing. What do you call that? I call that complete sociopathic behavior. And Fairstein believes Robert Chambers hasn't changed very much, despite all the time he spent behind bars. Is it possible that maybe he thinks now that maybe he does really have remorse? He's older, and he's done 15 years of hard time. He's done 15 years of hard time, uh, made harder because of his own drug abuse in state prison. I'm not willing to buy his words. I'm looking forward to seeing what his actions are in the next 15. Robert Chambers' murder trial had all the electric buzz of a New York City media event. The newspaper columnists were dissecting your entire life. Sure. Just as they will when they see this, they will look at every time I move my thumb, if I jiggle my leg, if I sit forward, if I lean back, they're going to look for it. The plea bargain required that Chambers admit in court that he intended to harm Jennifer Levin, something he had and always continues to deny. On March 25th, 1988, Robert Chambers pled guilty to manslaughter one. And for the first time, I had to take responsibility for this. But you didn't want to. Oh, if I could have, you know, jumped in an airplane and flown to the moon, I would have done it. How do you feel, Robert? He would be sentenced to five to 15 years in prison. It's rough, it's dangerous, it's scary. How, how were you treated inside? by the other inmates? Um, I think in the beginning it was more hands-off. I think everybody just watched to see how I would act. You were never sexually assaulted? No. Were you ever assaulted physically? No. In your entire 15 years? Mm -hmm. Chambers says the older inmates taught him the ropes, but how he actually did his time cut straight to the heart of his story and perhaps his character and the question of whether or not Robert Chambers will ever stay out of trouble. 27 disciplinary violations for everything from weapons possession, drugs possession, assault, disobeying direct orders. You know, when you hear this, you're thinking, this guy hasn't learned anything. Mm -hmm. He hasn't learned a single thing. And, you know, and had you been a model prisoner, people would have maybe believed you had changed. Mm -hmm. Maybe you had learned something. Right. What this demonstrates to folks is that you haven't. Chambers says many of the charges were minor, even trumped up. But because of his poor disciplinary record, he'd spend more than four years in solitary confinement. You read, you write letters, do a lot of thinking. The diploma from the paralegal course I had taken, 
Chambers did take college courses, even making the dean's list. Criminal law, 94, 98. And he claims to have beat one habit in prison that he found impossible to shake on the streets. You're clean? Sure. You are clean? Yes, I am. How long? 93, 94. I smoked marijuana in jail. It was a stupid thing to do. Wrong choice. I did. Heroin? No. Coke? No. But this inmate misbehavior report from Greenhaven Prison shows that on June 19, 1997, a corrections officer found heroin hidden in Chambers' cell. So when it was time for Chambers to face the parole board, they were unimpressed with his efforts at rehabilitation, particularly when eight years after Jennifer Levin's death, Chambers appeared anything but remorseful. I want to read to you what you told them. Okay. I guess I could give the party line and say I have learned my lesson, but that's not how I feel at the moment. Reading this, it sounds like you're arrogant, you're flip. And you know what? In many of those instances that you just said, you're probably right. Probably arrogant, probably angry. Robert Chambers is trying, he says, to get on with his life. He has a girlfriend someone he met after his arrest in 1986 and has supported him ever since. She didn't want us to show her face or divulge her name, but she says that Chambers has learned now how to be a friend. She stood by you for 15 years. Yes, she has. Were you surprised? Yeah. Did you ever say why? In a roundabout way, but sometimes you don't want to push your luck. I don't think it's too bad out today. There are some people who say that young women aren't safe to be around you, mm -hmm. that you're a threat, that you're a dangerous charmer. Should women be afraid of you? No. There's no reason to be. He claims to have no money of his own. He says he wants to earn a college degree and find steady work. It doesn't matter if it's a restaurant, car wash, whatever it may be, just something to feel normal and something to be responsible. That's the only way you can start, one step at a time. What are you willing to do? Anything. Chambers owes the Levin family $25 million, the result of an uncontested civil suit. And if he lands a job, any job, 10% of his pay goes to the Levins for the rest of his life. Do you plan on writing a book or participating in a movie deal? I have no plans to write a book. I do not want to write a book. And I have no interest in any type of movie deal. I, my, I have not made any money off this. My family and my friends have not made any money off this. None of us ever intend to. Is Robert Chambers sincere about turning his life around? Has he really changed? What little we saw of him, Robert Chambers appeared measured and sober, his mother Phyllis setting the tone. This is not a time of celebration. You told me. No, it's not. Why not? Um, I do not feel to celebrate Robert's homecoming. And Jennifer is never coming home. It's a sad time. This is real life. This is real death. Somebody's dead. There has to be some action after the words. My action of doing 15 years? No. That's just the beginning. It's not an end. The trial didn't end. The trial lives with me. And every day, I'm on trial. In 2004, the year after our interview, Robert Chambers was arrested and charged with possession of a controlled substance and driving with a suspended license. Preppy killer Robert Chambers walked out of criminal court today to face yet another gaggle of reporters. He pled guilty and spent 100 days in jail. Three years later, Chambers was arrested again. He and his girlfriend were charged with selling drugs out of their apartment. Robert Chambers was allegedly selling enough cocaine out of his 17th floor apartment to put the so-called preppy killer away for life. His girlfriend pled guilty to a lesser charge and was sentenced to five years probation. 
Robert Chambers pled guilty in exchange for a sentence of 19 years. His earliest release date from prison is in 2024. Jennifer Levin's mother. He got more time in jail for selling drugs than he did for murdering my daughter, which is pretty amazing. The Levins have never accepted any apology from Robert Chambers. This year, Jennifer would have been 48 years old. think Robert Chambers can stay out of prison when he's released? Chat now on Twitter and Facebook. Juliana, she was like a magnet to a lot of men. The DNA was all female. This was a whodunit. There was no DNA. Who shot Greg? I have my assumptions. We're really screwed. CBSN, live news streaming to you. CBSN, CBS News, always on.